Gettysburg Bloody July 1863 is a new game in the Bloody Civil War series by Paul Koenig. I played a game in this series in the past, Chancellorsville, and I really enjoyed it. I really liked the historical feel that it had. And now we have an installment, Gettysburg, the mother of all battles of the American Civil War. Definitely the most iconic, the most remembered, and the one that somehow means the most. Uh, Gettysburg, it's a two-player game, but also perfectly playable as a solitary game. Um, it is a simple war game, definitely approachable uh, by non-war gamers. It can be a beginner's war game. Now, when we're talking about beginner's war games, usually we have the idea of small games. See, actually you have a large game with a large map, but not too cluttered with units. So still manageable when it comes to the number of units that you need to control very accessible when it comes to the rules, but with a lot of options thanks to the large map. Let me show you how it works. This is the map of the game, which is pretty large. I would say it's unusually large for a map that is a single piece. Uh, this is a single map. With maps this large, usually you expect two smaller maps adjacent to one another. Not here, which means that the map was folded over several times to fit in the box. When you first open it, it may take you a little bit of work to make it lay flat. You'll probably want to use some plexiglass. I placed two pieces of plexiglass on the two halves here and I had no problem. The map represents the area of Gettysburg and around Gettysburg. The colors are simple, but definitely functional and not too unpleasant. It's an X, a great map, as you can see. There's a turn track there, and nothing else really in terms of tracks. Very functional, it shows you the area where the engagement will take place. Units in this game are divided in Union units and Confederate units, of course. They're also grouped by color bands that indicate the headquarter that the units belong to and are led by. You have cavalry units, infantry, artillery, and again, headquarters. Uh, cavalry and infantry have a stacking limit of two, that is in a hex you can have two infantry or two cavalry or a cavalry unit and an infantry unit, artillery stacks for free with cavalry units and artillery units. The values that you see here are combat factor on the left and movement factor on the right. As for the headquarters, they have a movement factor printed here at the bottom. Here they have a range in excess up to which they can help their disorganized units to reorganize and the reorganized value that you use when you're trying to reorganize your units. During the game, units will get disorganized and initially they will receive a D2 marker. At the beginning of a turn, you flip that into a D1 marker. It is simply to uh, keep track of how long the unit is disorganized and when you have a unit with a D1 later you can uh, try to reorganize it. Usually you will need to roll a D6 and to roll a 1 or a 2 to be able to reorganize it if the unit is being helped by its own headquarter, then the number that you have up there, the reorganization value, is the maximum number that you can roll to be able to reorganize a unit and to remove the disorganization marker. So at the beginning of the turn, what you do is you flip the D2 markers to D1. Also, you can start uh, building building uh, strong points, uh, breastworks, and then the following turn you will flip this marker to indicate that your defensive system is complete, that you can ignore retreat result and that you get a modifier in combat. So this is useful if you're trying to defend a position. Other than this, after this initial phase where breastworks may be built and this organization goes down, then it is time to move units. The Union player activates first, then the Confederate. First you have a movement phase where the active player can move any and all of his units up to their full movement allowance. If you are following your roads and you're not too close to the opponents, you can use strategic movement, which is considerably faster. Otherwise you simply go up to the movement allowance and 
and different types of terrain of course will cost a different uh, amount of movement points when you move adjacent to an opponent you have to stop there is a zone of control here that is projected by units in the six axis around them so you have to stop there. Interesting enough, when you move out of a zone of control of a unit for whatever reason, zone of control of an enemy unit of course, you get disorganized. So simply detaching from an enemy is always dangerous, turning your side or maybe walking backwards. Still, uh, detaching from a unit that you made contact with is dangerous because it disorganizes you. But you have to stop once you enter an enemy zone of control. Once the active player has completed movement then you have combat in which the player must attack all of the units that the player just move adjacent to. So basically you are committed to attack units. All units that you are adjacent to must be attacked. Interesting enough here there is a limit to the number of units that can attack out of an X. That is only a unit can attack out of an X in one direction. So in this case only one of my two units in this hex would be able to attack this hex here. As for the defender, maybe there is only one unit, maybe there are multiple ones. Usually only a single defender can defend against a one direction attack. A one direction attack is an attack that comes from a single hex or from two adjacent hexes. So only one of the units of the defenders will actually participate to the fight. Basically this simulates orientation and different deployment of the units within the hex. We don't see that but one unit is a little more here and the other they're in the back so only one of them is engaged. However there may be direction for multiple attacks so if the defender has two units in the hex that is being attacked and is attacked from three different directions from three different hexes or from non-adjacent hexes then the defender gets to use both of his units into separate defenses so you resolve that attack as two different attacks and artillery can always attack. So you determine who participates in each attack, you compute the odds uh, of the strength of the defender versus that of the attacker and you turn that into uh, an, an odd system, an odd value that then you will check on the combat result table. One, two, three, one, two, to three to four etc etc if you don't want to calculate here there is a convenient odd, odd determination table suppose that the defender has 10 and the attacker has eight then that's an attack at three to four and use the corresponding column so once you have the column based on the ratio of the strength of the defender and the attacker you roll a die, you cross-reference the column that you're using with the result of the die that may be modified and then you simply read and apply the result. The result may be contact, so nothing happens. Maybe D1, one defending unit of the defender's choice loses a step. Exchange, uh, defending unit and attacking unit controlling player's choice loses a step. Exchange plus DR, that is plus defending units retreat, things like this. Now, what is interesting here is that, as you can see, many results will give you a disorganized value, as I said. Also, when you lose a step in combat, you uh, are shattered. So, you do uh, uh, receive this uh, marker here, shattered. There should be a D here, this one hasn't been cut correctly. By the way, incidentally, these are good counters, meaning that they are glossy, they are resistant, they are pretty thick, but not all of them have been, appeared to have been cut correctly, so sometimes they look a little close to the, as you can see this one, for example, does have the D, so the words may not be aligned always in the same way. Anyways, units that lose uh, steps become shattered. And that means, again, that they have a lot of penalties, the same penalties as being disorganized, but you cannot reorganize easily from being shattered. You have to wait until a night turn. Night turns is when the shattered results are removed. 
And the effects of being disorganized and shattered are that if you're attacking with a disorganized unit, you have a penalty. If you're attacking a disorganized unit, you have a bonus. Disorganized cavalry and infantry uh, are not as effective as they otherwise would be when they're using strategic movement along roads. And very important, a shattered unit may not attack or enter an enemy zone of control. It may defend, but it will defend with the reduced value that you flipped it down to. Also, shattered units are particularly vulnerable because they may surrender. If they are completely surrounded by enemy units or enemy zones of control, then they surrender. So you're attacking, you're fighting, but your units will get disorganized and shattered fast, and then you may want to remove the shattered units to the rear and try to send in a reserve to prevent your shadow units from receiving the final blow from the opponent. This is the basic idea, it's a very simple game. At the core it is the beginning of the turn, disorganize, uh, remove disorganized levels, build the breastworks, move, attack, both players do that. At the end you roll to see if you are able to remove disorganization and that's it, the turn is over. There are a couple of different rules when it comes to night turns but the main ideas are the same. Uh, and the game uh, has several scenarios, so one for each day, and then there's a campaign game, and victory is based on victory points earned by eliminating enemy units and by controlling key location on the map, such as this one. So, as I said in the intro, I really like the fact that this game is absolutely simple. It has like four or five pages of rules, and yet uh, it is not just simply move, compute the odds and attacks. The organization of the units, the second limits, create their own set of challenges that you have to deal with. Concentrating units to launch powerful attacks is pretty... Uh, it requires maneuvering, it's not super complex, but does require some thinking and does require uh, some, some planning. Also what I like I didn't mention before is that combat is not necessarily resolved in a single um, round. You resolve the round the way I explained, odds, table, uh, perform, uh, implement the results, at the end of which one of the two sides may have retreated. It is also possible for the players to retreat voluntarily. But if after the mandatory and voluntary retreats there still are units of the two sides adjacent to one another, then that the player that just was the attacker can renew the attack. So actually you can launch another round of attack and you go through the same procedure. There's no limit to the maximum number of rounds that there is in a combat as long as at the end of a round units of the two sides are still adjacent, then an attack can be launched. So that's already an interesting aspect there that you don't see all that often, but that allows you a little bit of flexibility. If you had an inconclusive attack, then you can press on the attack and maybe you'll be luckier, maybe it'll be a disaster. If you're trying to gain control of an objective fast, uh, then that could be the way to go. But of course it is an investment of resources that you're launching and maybe at increasingly worse odds and then it's up to you to decide when it is the time to stop uh, because the odds are not nearly uh, reasonable anymore. Now, about the disorganization and the shattered units, especially the shattered units. As I read the rules and then I started playing the game, I was a little bit doubtful about that. Because as you start fighting, units get shattered really fast. And once they are shattered, there isn't much that they can do. They can just run around and hide and hope that nobody will deal the final blow to them. Uh, which worried me. I thought, well, what's going to happen in the second part of the day? The game is divided in either three days as, as days of a campaign or each scenario. What's going to happen towards the end of a day? Uh, people are just going to be shattered and, and slow down and not be able to do much, right? Yes, exactly. And guess what? I like it. I like actually the overall effect that this creates. Uh, I was a little uncertain, but then I realized that actually this system does allow you to capture the ebb and flow of the battle, of some initial powerful clashes as the army then become less effective, then they both lose momentum, they both uh, are more concerned about preserving what they have, the following day they come back together, again they try to inflict a mighty blow, 
it prevents you from unrealistically uh, attacking with the same units over and over again without ever stopping. The Battle of Gettysburg lasted three days, uh, it had its breaks, it had those moments of suspension and you have this yes you will see the momentum of your troops decrease drastically and your troops will become more ineffective will become exhausted will become disorganized then you're just running around like a madman trying to reorganize and to maybe be able to reorganize the your unit before the opponent reorganizes his so that that is when you can catch the opponent off guard so the timing of uh, reorganization and and the shadow units is really interesting and yes the turns do play vastly differently early in a day and late in a day because at the beginning everybody's fresh and towards the end of the day everybody's exhausted and it is uh, it really the units work differently I like how the uh, system which is pretty punitive and pretty harsh units get shattered very easily I like how the system uh, does allow you to represent that aspect of disorganization demoralization fatigue exhaustion and so the the flow of the game uh, slows down uh, towards the end of a day but if you're in the right mood, if you see what the purpose of that is, of course, this slowing down is not a flaw in the design. Actually, to me, is one of the things that I like very much. Uh, probably one of the things that I like the most in this game. I, I like also other aspects. Uh, it is, overall, a simple game that could be used to introduce somebody to work gaming, but uh, it has more meat and more decisions than a lot of introductory war games in which you do have a small map, not many hexes, not many units. Here there's still a lot of things that you can do, a lot of experimenting uh, with attacking from different directions, organizing units differently. Uh, you do not, it's not a monster, you don't have a large number of units at the monster level, but it's not a mini game either. There is, I believe, enough meat to create decisions and interesting situations, and at the same time, everything remains pretty manageable and playable. You can definitely play a scenario in an evening, a campaign, well, I guess a little longer you need to play on three days. Uh, it also plays very well solitaire, which is an advantage. There is no secret information, so you can take your time studying the strategy. And definitely, uh, if you're playing solitaire, there's still, there's still the usual rewards that you have when you play both sides at the best of your possibilities. And this is a game that works very well in that fashion. Gettysburg, Bloody July. 1863. Definitely a nice introductory war game about a great topic and it's a game that combines simplicity with a good amount of historical feel.